Hey right. everybody, welcome to another episode of I've Got Questions, a pre-modern podcast. My name is William Hurst, and we are here again. This is actually a take two. We tried to do this before, but we all just sounded like crap, but we're back again. We are with the amazing prison master himself, Mr. Ricky Thorson, otherwise known as Thursday on MTGO the recent winner of the Misty Mountain uh, Pre-Modern Fall Cup. And we are also with the debuting TV tyrant, um, Corey hey. Harris. Hey, hey, guys. How are we doing today? We're doing awesome. great. That's awesome. I'm really excited to finally meet the, the legendary man, the myth, the legend, TV tyrants. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It's uh, a – and, Corey, we got to say, um, so we're here talking kind of about like some Terra – Terra Vordex, this mono green uh, Ponza Terra Vordex that has recently sprung forth like a big old giant monster to start taking over formats, winning the um, Fall Cup, putting up numbers online, and it's a deck that even uh, Mike Flores decided to go and buy the cards for. So you and your creation have influenced a lot of things. Uh, so before we get too crazy... Um, we didn't do this last time when we did our first one. Is Corey? How did you get into Magic? How did you find pre modern? Oh well, that's a that is a different question. Uh, it is. So I I started Magic way back in eighth uh, as a little tyke, and my best friend's older brother uh, would buy cards and then give us the crappy ones. So we would play like fake magic decks where it was like <laughs> a pile of commons from 8th edition and some lands. And then we would just play these like bog, I think it was 8th edition, bog imp was one of the big ones. Nice. We love us some bog imps around here. Might have been 6th edition. Anyway, it was way back then. Um, <laughs> and then like my my prize possession was a one of him to Torok. And that was the, like, if you got that in your opener, that was that you just won the game because everything we were playing was just garbage back when creatures were truly <laughs> terrible at the common level. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, we didn't really, I didn't really get into it seriously until high school. I had a friend who got me into it and uh, he wanted to, he was just starting, Modern was just about to start at that point. Like we were an mm. extended I'd only played really casually and he got me into playing it more regularly. Um, but I was broke as hell. So I played Popper mm -hmm. uh, as the only format. Penny Dreadful and Popper were really the only formats that I was into for most of my gaming career. But I was, okay. you know, I'd started back when pre-modern, you know, when when extended was a thing and where pre-modern what is playing in the wheelhouse of, but just on like the crappiest possible cards. <laughs> and when I moved from wanting to be an academic to moving into working in finance, I could afford to uh buy better children's card game cards. So uh I got back in I got I started up pre-modern in 2020 during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Uh, by that time I'd quit Popper. I don't like what happened to Popper. Um, the format went from being a very specific kind of format where everything was very kind of pre-modern-ish at the time mm -hmm. before that, you know, recently it was, it didn't have all of this crazy, like flickering things in and out. It was very much like a counter spell format with like kind of crappy creatures and kind of good spells, which is really what defines pre-modern. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in the last, you know, starting about 2018, Fire Design replaced New World Order, and Popper really kind of ate its original form. And so then I was looking for a format that matched my design, like what I like out of a game, mm -hmm. and I found pre-modern. It wasn't, it, there was only 16 of us playing pre-modern online in 2020. Like we had leagues that were only 16 people regularly. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of, I kind of was playing it as it was taking off. Like it had been really tiny. And then for like, I joined in right as the, the wave came in and now it's, you know, 50 people a league. Nice. Absolutely. And then uh, Ricky, we kind of covered this on our last one, but can you give us a brief uh, rundown for those who haven't heard how you uh, joined and yeah. found magic? 
Yeah, I, I played casually in, uh, like, Mercadian Masks, so like, just crack and packs and kitchen table. Um, eventually, I got into competitive, like, around Odyssey, um, playing standard and extended at a little shop in Beloit, Wisconsin called AK Comics. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, super fortunate. There's a lot of really strong players that a few of them even still play pre-modern now um, that uh, kind of came out of there. So kind of learned how to play more competitively there. Um, played mostly modern, and then uh, I took a long break uh, for a few years after, uh, like, Mox Opal bit the dust. Because yeah. I always kind of liked artifacts based prison decks, Lantern, KCI, the War Prison deck, that stuff. And then uh, when Misty Mountain held their first pre-modern, that's kind of when I picked up Magic again. And then, obviously, I, I got hooked right away. Yep. You're definitely back with a vengeance for it. Uh, I haven't seen you miss a bunch. Now, let's get to the matter at hand. Um, land tax got banned, um, and with it, the format changed. Um, it has, it's a non-rotating format, but in a way, the banning rotated things a little bit to bring newer strategies to the front and shifted the balance. One of those balances was the ability to actually play lands, uh, out onto the field, which is important for playing magic. Um, but another advance is we're starting to, we started to see different sort of prison strategies come out. Um, and one of them was prison strategies using Terra War as a finisher. And we've seen different variants, uh, green, white Terra War with like Armageddon's Cataclysms. We saw some red, green ponds and stuff earlier uh, that I believe also had Terra Wars. But um, Tyrant, you put together something very interesting in the form of mono green um Terra Prison. However, one of one of these things we have to do is we actually have to find the name for this damn thing. Um, Tyrant I'm, Oath. I'm, <laughs> I'm all fine with Tyrant Oath. So from here on out in this episode, we're going to call it Tyrant Oath, and that's okay. what it's going to be. So Tyrant Oath stands for a Terravore based finishing deck that uses land destruction and prison elements and Oath of Druids to control the board and finish with a big old meaty man at the end of the day, or some man lands. Um, so can you tell us how this particular version of this archetype came together, kind of its foundations and where it started. Sure. Uh, so I was playing a really, I don't know if it was bad natural orders, like coming back in, but when I started out, I was, whenever I start a new format, I go, what are the most broken cards that aren't broken yet? And then I start brewing. Cause you know, I'm, I'm kind of known more for brewing than I am for like my ability to play the game. Uh, if you look you at my record, <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> uh, you know, I I play some some pretty crazy decks. Uh, I'm currently working on a Lotus deck where you untap Lotus Veil. Anyway, it's going to be great. Uh, one day I'll get it to work, and you'll all see. Have you but, tried it with Mind Over Matter yet? I did. Uh, well, that's not about that. Anyway, Fine. so I'm a brewer. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was playing uh, Nick Fit Natural Order and somebody oathed, I, and I was natural ordering into a Neshoba, and it did pretty okay. Um, it's it's kind of like, it was kind of like the Rock but bigger. And mm -hmm. uh, I played against an oath player, and it was just like he's paying two mana to do what I'm paying four mana two cards to do, and he doesn't have to gunk up his deck with a bunch of just like garbage creatures to make this work like he just gets to play oath of druids and bam the game's <laughs> over yeah. uh and then i tried playing a couple of like the extant uh oath of druid neshoba decks and what i realized playing them is you're never gonna hard cast neshoba true which means that it's really just a control deck, right? Like, if the other person doesn't play a creature, Neshoba just sits dead in your hand, and so does Oath of Druid, and I didn't like how that felt a lot of the time. And Neshoba's not actually that big. Uh, sure. And so then I was looking at the synergies, and I was like, you know, if I play Terravore, when I, you know, Oath into Terravore, this is in early 2021, I think, winter of 2021. Mm -hmm. right. Um I then it it gets bigger based on the oath of effect because it's going to drop a bunch of lands in. And then mm -hmm. I started playing with that as like, okay, but then what if I just start blowing up lands? And on the other side of it was all of the what I considered like the good lands weren't being played. Rishadin Port wasn't being played. Wasteland wasn't being played. 
So I kind of built it as this, over time, this fusion of like, what if Terrabor was good on its own? And I'd also seen already that Manlands are like one of the best ways to win in pre-modern. Right, um, exactly. The Manlands are often bigger than the aggro creatures. Yes. Um, so then I was like, I want Treetop Village. I want to play Manlands. And then I couldn't be multiple colors and have all those colorless lands. So over time, these kind of converged. And early on, I was playing a lot of jank because I didn't really understand pre-modern until probably the summer of 2021. I didn't really have a grasp on what we were doing. <laughs> mm. And uh, pre-modern is a very sharp format with a very low mono curve. Um, and it feels like, because there's so many cool five drops, that it should actually be like a really big mid rangey format. And that's not pre-modern. Pre-modern is like legacy. It's like, if it costs more than three, it's hard to cast. Uh, you're sure. probably not doing it. So uh, I kept cutting the curve. I started out with like plow unders and other, uh, oh, what was the other one? We talked about it last uh, time. Stunted um, growth. Stunted growth, which oh. is a really cool card. They put three cards from their hand on top of their deck for five. I figured that was a good card. Uh, never been able to cast it in the game. <laughs> and like by turn five, they have counter spell up. It was just, it wasn't going to happen or I'd lost the game to an aggro deck. So I just, over time, the development of the deck has really been finding more broken cards to slide into the deck like mm -hmm. Mox Diamond, Sphere of Resistance, and sliding out the jank from the top of the curve. Um, and the, the lower the curve has gotten, the better the deck has gotten. So mm -hmm. that's that's pretty much the the long and the short of it is, is like we're, we're just looking now for how can we get the curve a little bit lower. Um, and then we'll talk about like the different strategies that people are taking with that. But that's really the, the course of the deck is like the, the main idea was always there. And then over time, we've just been slicing away the, the chafe and getting to the good part, which is just a very explosive, very proactive prison deck. Absolutely. And those are some words, uh, explosive, proactive, and then prison that sometimes don't get mixed together, but it truly is. Uh, that mana curve getting lower is great. Um, and one card we've seen a resurgence, and Ricky, I'll kind of throw it over to you to come to your ex experience within the last uh, Fall Cup at Misty Mountain Games, was um, this card Sphere of Resistance has really started to gain the traction that it probably has should have had for a while. Um, so Sphere of Resistance, two mana uh, artifact. When it comes in, is it, it's two mana, right? Yeah. Yep. yeah. Uh, each spell costs one more to play. Um, doesn't sound huge, but in a world where the mana cost is low and getting to four mana, five mana is tricky, anything pushing above that is harder. So, Ricky, you went through a field of over 30 people, good players, ended up winning um, the Missy Mountain event. Talk to, you, to us about your experience with uh, the deck and how it functioned across kind of the wider game and um, how it felt with Sphere of Resistance and the other prison elements. Yeah, I, I think Sphere of Resistance is what really attracted me to the deck the most. That, like, I, I was first kind of admiring TB Tyrant from afar as he kicked my teeth in when I was on, like, green-white prison oath and stasis and stuff. And then uh, once he worked in Spheres, like, I, I kept debating playing this. I kept, like, putting it in shopping carts and taking it back out at the last minute. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I think Sphere is what makes me like the deck the most. It, it like breaks the symmetry on it the furthest, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it's most reliant on lands of, of any deck in the format right now. Like it, and I expected a lot of the Cataclysm deck, there were other variants of the green-white prison decks. And since this has so many more man lands in it, uh, it's a huge advantage there. And then uh, just generally, like it relies on its lands better than even the green-white prison deck. Um mm -hmm. And so, plus combined with all the eight LD spells, it's 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 a work of art. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not in front of a computer to review the matchups again, but I, I remember like for the most part, all of them were pretty mana intensive decks and all like mm -hmm. multicolored decks too. Right. Because um, I think it was like Feb, Landstill, that Mana Breach deck, um, and those were all like pr pretty tight matches, right? But like mm -hmm. Feb's like super aligned on all these like different colors and stuff, and finally sure. they do play birds, and then you get the oath activations. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember round two. Do you have the 
pulled up by chance? No? I don't, and it's not a okay. it's not a huge deal. But you played. I watched you play this because um, we were generally in the same area most of the time. I was watching yeah. over the shoulder. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when I saw it happen against Wide Breath, uh, you truly did see the power of uh, sphere resistance. I keep coming back to that because one mana is such a crazy amount, uh, even for single casting, but especially if decks are wanting to double spell in a turn. Uh, they were prepared to. And the fact that Rashad in port also was in the deck was amazing. Constantly seeing um, things being tapped down. I know against Stasis, if Rashad in port's bad for me because it is uh, keeping my mana tapped down. Um, one question I had from before is I can't remember, are your guys' versions anywhere running Winter Orb at all? Or is that just not a fit for the deck at all because it constrains you guys too much? Because you're reliant on your, your like lands to be your spells. Right. So it's going to yeah. hurt quite a bit, right? Because you, exactly. you're relying on like your Mistress Factories and Treetops to be mm -hmm. either attacking or blocking. And then the ports, I mean, it's a huge part of the game plan. Like really often I found, uh, like on the draw, like, it's correct to just go Mox Port Go and port them in their upkeep, not even play like a two drop, like yeah. to just start immediately taxing their mana right off the bat. Because like port is a, basically the spell in the deck, mm -hmm. right? Um, so exactly. you're super reliant on using those abilities more than anything. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So as the deck has come together, um, the only true creatures in the deck beyond the manlands are four Terrapores. Um did it ever feel in a world of source to plowshares where that is too few threats, even with the manlands? Because we have seen uh, a resurgence of both Armageddon's. We've seen a resurgence of um, wastelands, uh, all because land tax is now gone and mana is so much harder to come by. If it gets lower, it gets destroyed. Um, is there any? Was there any thought of trying to include anything else other than that, or was that ever an issue? Just having those four I, threats plus man lands? Yeah, I, I could never imagine that. I mean, that, there's like Black Vice out of the sideboard. But like mm -hmm. the Terravores, like you only need to attack once. Those things are huge, right? <laughs> you, like, you, sure. If, if you connect once, it's like 15 damage. And then like maybe they took a couple off fetches and pain lands. Like they're, they're dead. Um, yeah. That there was a matchup against uh, the green white Oathclasm deck game one. Like he, he ran through all four of my Terravores. It, it definitely has come up. But like, mm -hmm. A lot of times, like, they have to go so far out of their way to actually swords your terrible, right? Because you're, like, taxing them and fighting them over all their white mana the whole game. That, right. like, they're devoting, like, way more resources. It's it's kind of innocuous, but it's not just a white mana for swords. Because, like, they, sure. they're navigating the game carefully to sandbag their white mana or they're paying extra on spheres mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, so it ends up being kind of a fight for them to do it. And even if they do, like, it's not the end of the world. You just gained, like, 15 life. Like, mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Go ahead, Tyre. Oh, I was going to say, I agree. Um, I think it's, especially since there's no mono white deck, the thing is, is that if there's if they're playing multicolors, we can keep them off one color. We're playing land destruction. Mm -hmm. We're playing wastelands. And so you just kind of, when you're, when you're playing the deck against a multicolor deck, you kind of pick a color to knock out of the game. And then sure. you focus on that. And you're like, we're tapping down white or we're blowing up all the white. Or maybe if it's blue sometimes, and you're like, we're just going to make it so they can't counterspell by just never giving them blue mana. Sure. Um, and so swords can, you can get swords, but a lot of the time we're better at control in the long run. And so like mm -hmm. now we've just delayed the game, which is already in our favor. Like the longer it mm -hmm. goes... We have man lands. They have way less. No other. I don't think any other deck plays as many man lands as we do. I can't imagine. So the and the single color mana base allows for that to certainly happen. Absolutely. Um, so what if someone were to say, okay, I have this mono green variant of this strategy. I also have the green white variant. Both of them work in slight in similar ways. Not. Not the same, but similar. What what do you think the best argument for people to pick up the mono green version is versus, say, a green white version of a deck trying to accomplish the same thing? Uh, Tyrant, why don't we start with you? Uh, I I would basically say we're more proactive, and so like the white deck is a reactive control deck. They let things hit the battlefield and then they respond to them, which means that you have to have a variety of responses. 
based on okay. the kinds of things that are affecting the board. We have a very, this is the way my brain works. So that's how the deck works. We have one response to everything, which is don't let it happen. And so we are ahead, we are sliding in under them and we're like, mm -hmm. I don't care if it's a creature or a spell because they're not going to cast it. That's right. our goal. Gotcha. And so it, we're faster, we're a faster deck, we're a more proactive deck, but we mm -hmm. also once, if we fall behind, we can't catch up the same way that green white does, which is the, the sure. weakness of the deck is once you fall behind a lot of the time, you're kind of like, I'm going to hope that I get a big enough terror to fix this. But you can feel it when the game, when you have a bad hand and the game comes out of your control. You're like, there's no fix cards. We're supposed to be proactive. What do you think, Ricky? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that's 100 percent true. I mean, I, I played that green white uh, prison oath deck like quite a bit. Like, I, I do really like that deck. But the the reality is, is like it, it has swords, rave revelation, you know, seal. Um, all of these things are meant to like after something has resolved, right? So then there's this competing priority of like, am I porting you and wasting you and stuff? Or mm -hmm. am I resolving my seal and casting swords and stuff like that? So it can be kind of awkward to play that dance. It is nice to like have that out in case like they do slip in the, the, the card that you don't want them to. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, by and large, like you're playing a much more reactive game with green, white, and you also have to guess the meta a lot more. Whereas with the mono green deck, like, no one wants their lands destroyed. Everyone's trying to cast spells. Mm -hmm. And even if they're cheap spells, a sphere is going to make them more expensive to the point that they're going to need more lands than they planned on. Um, and this works against a, a, every strategy. There is no way to, at least in pre-modern, right, to get away with not doing that. Like, mm -hmm. um, you, the, the furthest extreme case is Fluctuator. But still, I mean, you sphere and then start, you know, porting them and wasting them and stuff. And they're not happy anymore. That is very true. They are not going to be happy if you do that. So speaking of the land destruction, we obviously have Wastelands in there, incredibly powerful card. Uh, and then we have the full suite of kind of the eight green uh, spells, the Thermokarst and um, Winter's Grasp, each three mana spells that destroy Did a you land. Did you think about those? <laughs> I was trying to think of the pronunciation. Pretty modern have... staples coming at you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, but... Uh, Tyrant, you were talking uh, before about uh, plow unders and there's things like acidic slimes and th things of that nature. Um, your land destruction is not necessarily I'm always just keeping you at one land. It is it's selective with the deck, right? It, as you were mentioning before, it's not you know keeping you at one land. This was an avalanche riders blinking it with momentary blink and like just doing all that stupid stuff. It's you're not going to get white mana. You're not going to get blue mana. What is the strategy then, if that is the case, and it works very effectively against decks like um, elves, goblins, sly? Why, how do you approach those where the mana denial strategy doesn't work as effectively uh, as sort of the meta at Misty was? And the meta at Misty was a lot of survival decks, a lot of mid rangey kind of soupy decks. Uh, where these Terravor prison decks thrive in. They love that atmosphere. What do you do in a meta that's full of elves, goblins, hell, even Suicide Black, things like that? So it's actually... it. Uh, two of those I would consider some of our top enemies, and then one of them I don't, which is like one of the great mysteries of the deck is that people can't guess what the good and bad matchups are. So sure. elves is a horrifying nightmare of a matchup. And uh, I think we talked about it last time we did this, but uh, like your chances of winning are very low. You have to basically turn one, either a cursed totem or an oath of druids in order to have a chance. Mm -hmm. um, those happen because there's enough of them in the deck often. I and mean, we have enough ramp. It happens often enough that we don't have the worst way, like matchup with elves, but it mm -hmm. never feels good. It always feels like they've got like a knife to your throat and you're like just about <laughs> to lose. So, uh, so they're, they're a hard deck. Um, goblins is like, if they don't have lackey, they're kind of a mid rangey deck. And sure. so, we're like hoping to dodge T1 lackey a lot of the time or put a sphere down before they play it. Um, sure. But they don't play that many lands and they're kind of a mid range soupy pile deck of just kind of like bad creatures without lackey, which is like an absurdly powerful card, right? Like it's up there sure. with swords to plowers, shares or dreadnought 
Uh, like no. you're just like, this is a format defining card as a one, one. It's amazing. Um, exactly. I love pre-modern. So goblins is really hard too. You're really trying to dodge the, the nightmare scenario. And then if you can get to turn three, where you're not like totally infested with goblins, you're probably okay. So mm -hmm. it's just about in that one, it's about like keeping them off play however you can, like assembling the strategy of stay alive. You're eventually going to get bigger creatures than them and your, your terrors will get to like 17, 17 eventually. And you're going to win. So like, that's the game with goblins, like just delay with, with elves. The game is like, hope they choke a lot of the time. <laughs> like, um, and then uh, Sly is actually a very different one because we're heavily favored against Sly. Okay. And uh, I think Ricky can attest to that. You've played a couple of Sly ones, right? Yeah, I, and I also did not believe you until I actually played it. And I was like, holy smokes, this is actually really easy. Like, yeah. Yeah. So what, so what makes that matchup easy? As a Sly player... Uh, whenever I want to take a break from stasis, um, I don't recall losing this particular matchup very much. So I guess that analysis surprises me. Um, uh, so tell, tell me why that is, and maybe I am missing something or I have not played it recently. So, so Sly in pre-modern, it's, if I would explain it, it's like this. Sly has to blow up its own lands. And it has to have a bunch of really crappy creatures in play in order to get damage. It's not like Legacy or Modern Burn right now, where you're like highly consistent explosive damage. It's like you play a two one for one, and then he hits two to three times, and that's how you manage to like snowball your damage in. It doesn't yeah. play that many lands, and it doesn't play enough actual burn to just burn someone out with lightning bolts. Like there's not, we don't have chain lightning, lightning bolt, skull crack uh you know all the all the bells and whistles so what happens a lot of the time is we just play an oath on game one and they can't really play around it they have their their you know lava mancers or their pops in play and then we're playing a huge ass terrivore really fast um mm -hmm. and so we are often the aggro in that one where you're like hold up a man land to block and then your terrivore kills them it's a surprisingly good game one sure Game two and three, the Sly player is going to side out their creatures that don't die, right? So that they don't get Oath. And we're going to slide out Oath and put in Zurin Orb. And how that game goes is it's like very, very tight. You're just blowing up lands because they, have, they can't use their Fire Blasts because they won't have enough mountains. That's like your goal. And they can't play their, their uh, Ball Lightnings for the same reason. So... They're stuck on trying to burn you out with like what they have and like Mog Fanatic attacks. And then you play your Terravore. And if you have a Terravore and a Zurin Orb on the battlefield at the same time, you can just slowly blow up your own lands, which will gain you enough life to be out of reach of their burn. And then your Terravore will be way out of reach of their burn and you just kill them. Um, and so it's, we have like a very, structured plan which is like get zurin orb out mm -hmm. get some man lands out to block whatever crappy things they have and try to just blow up lands until we get to a terravore it feels apocalyptic like you end up with like no life and then you land your terravore and then you just gain all your life back and then but like you have no permanence except the terravores in play <laughs> um so it looks like you you just barely made it and in a certain sense you do but it feels like a consistently good game for us okay. like my yeah um i think burn could definitely side in answers but nobody's done it yet like found an answer to the to the Be problem quiet, will. will will does have the answer but oh does he share it. <laughs> well i want to know <laughs> don't worry about it don't worry about it I'm, a, I'm an off the wall thinker with sly a lot of my ideas are different so it's 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 not as much fun when the Terravor is smacking you in the face. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, so in any case, uh, so we know that elves, goblins, kind of those low to the ground that can pressure you, decks can get there. Um, are there any other bad matchups? How is 
I would assume your mid-range and control matchups are pretty good. Um, what about combo? What about things like an Angry Hermit, a um, Dream Halls, you know, esque sort of thing? Hell, even like Frantic Storm. What are those kind of decks like? I would assume it is night and day based on if you get a sphere of resistance into play early, and that has to be the key, right? Yeah. Gotcha. Is that sort of what it all comes down to is I either have sphere or no sphere, and then I win or lose, typically? Yeah, the, the fast, those really fast combos, like Hermit, Dreadnought, uh, Replenish, those are all pretty tough. Dream Halls, I don't know. I haven't seen a whole lot of it, but I can't imagine mm -hmm. it's that great. Because, um, mm -hmm. like, what are you going to wasteland there? You know, you're beating down treetops and trying to pour them. And, like, I, I feel like they're going to probably get a Dream Halls in play at some point. Um, sure. And, like, most of the Storm decks are going to be like that. Uh, but, yeah, the, like, th things with Dreadnought, Angry Hermit, it's tough, you know, because, like, you're pretty reliant on a Sphere. And mm -hmm. both of them are either going to counter it or discard it potentially before you get it into play. So it's kind of like cross your fingers. Um, both of them are super soft to sphere if it does stick. Sure. Um, so usually, like, it's kind of decided in the first three turns, even if, like, both players are still alive very safely. Like, mm -hmm. if you have a sphere in play, you know, in the first couple turns, you're probably going to win that game. Because once it's there, there's, it's not going anywhere, and they're going to have a really tough time navigating around it once you're you know, harassing their mana. That makes yeah. sense to me. Ahead, um, Storm is a weird one, though. I actually think that's one of the fun, most entertaining matches in the format because mm -hmm. they every time you blow up a land, they make their spells cheaper. And so you just play this game where they're like, like you're like, I should be getting ahead, and you're just treading water because they're slowly putting their amulets into play as you're <laughs> blowing up lands and putting in spheres. And so they're like, like eventually you're like, do I blow up enough lands that they fall behind or do they get enough metals and amulets in play that I that I do and then they storm off? Like it's a really entertaining one because it's so it's so <clears throat> not what the rest of the format feels like. Like it's mm -hmm. you're like, my man lands aren't really what's going on. Even the terror wars a lot of the time. It's really just about like who draws the most. Do they draw more ramp than you just draw land right. destruction? <laughs> yeah, <makes sense>. Absolutely. <laughs> so the deck in and of itself um, is mostly fleshed out. There are obviously flex spots, meta dependent. What are the next evolutions of this deck? What are the things we're trying to solve with the flex spots and ideas that have been tried or are on the back of the mind um, that should be tried for those wanting to pick up and jump into this deck? Because um, for those who don't know, uh, Tyron, you've been working on this deck essentially for a year. Um, by TC deck standards. So it's been a long haul. There's been a lot of work. So what are our next steps with this deck? I was going to let Ricky. Oh, you want oh, me to start? To go I was, first? Who, who, who do you want to go first? You, How you're, about you're the, like I said, the mad scientist that has uh, yep. designed the masterpiece here. So, <laughs> Well, I, uh, I think that, you know, like, one of the great secrets of this is like Billy has been helping out me out a lot. Uh, he goes by, hold on. So it's, uh, is that, um, is that Mayo from the dress crew? Billy TMC. Uh, okay, I don't know what is his, I don't know what his real yeah, name is. I think in discord, he goes by like Mayo and there's like duress or something in there too. In the Yeah. Discord. Yeah. He's, uh, so he's, he does a lot of innovating on his side as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I really, so like he was talking recently about two innovations he came up with and I'm going to bring them up here and steal credit for them. Um, awesome. So he was talking about like as a replacement for exploration, uh, putting in Hickory Woodlot. Okay. And so the reason, the reasoning is actually pretty sound. The pro one of the problems I have, I play the very explosive version with a lot more ramp. Um, mm -hmm. Thursday plays less ramp. He doesn't have the explorations in the format, in the deck. Mm -hmm. uh, Hickory Woodlot has an advantage that Exploration doesn't have, which is that if you have it and Mox in your hand, in your opener, you aren't punished the way you are having an Exploration and a Mox in your opener. Sure. Like, you can't discard the Exploration. There's not enough cards in hand unless it's all lands otherwise to use both. Um, mm -hmm. So those are usually bad hands. But this cleans up, like, the opening hands while still maintaining the explosiveness. 
um, by moving the hickory woodlots in. Because it's a land, you can ditch it to mock. So if it's in your opener, right. you're just like, get rid of that shit, put in a nor you know, any other land. So a dramatic, and it's a better top deck than Exploration sure. is by a lot. So uh, that's one that's, I think, a very clean, like, replacement or addition, like maybe one Exploration and two Hickory Woodlots or maybe all three Hickory Woodlots. But that'll definitely improve the consistency of openers, which is, I think, the most important thing about the deck is the opening hand. Like, you're, you're like, mm -hmm. we have to get, because it's so proactive, we want to get ahead immediately. Uh, right. So the opening hand is the most important hand, or the mm -hmm. most important turn is, like, turn one, did we ramp into something immediately or not. Um, sure. Another one that I we were working on was Smokestack as possibly a come from behind card because we have mm -hmm. so many more lands in play and then you just slam a Smokestack early on, they're going to run out of permanence because they have more spells than you. We're, right. We have the highest permanent count of any... That's not, maybe not entirely true, but we're very close to the highest permanent count in the format. Um, mm -hmm. It's like us and elves. And so yeah. like... That way, we don't have to worry about like running out of permanence to feed the smokestack. They're going to run out of lands. And then at that point, they have an empty board. We sack smokestack to itself. So I like that as an innovation. I'm not. I'm sure on Hickory Woodlot, that's an amazing one. Smokestack, okay. I think, is a, is a test-worthy one. What I do know is that Mulch is a bad card. Um, <laughs> years and years of play of this deck, and I've never once been, been like, you know what I really want is a Mulch on top of my hand. <laughs> you know yeah, okay, this draw well. should be a yeah um sylvan library is great exploration is good mox is good especially in the opener is amazing sphere of resistance is nearly always good but i've never been like i really would like to draw the mulch and we used to have more mulches and we've been cutting them and cutting them and cutting them and i'm like i don't want to see a mulch ever again it's just it's not a good card gotcha and ricky uh as you were playing it uh both online and at the event what yeah. What holes did you see that felt like they should be addressed, if any, um, and any ideas you have? Um, yeah, I, I wasn't a huge fan of Expo. I, I was first playing it with a couple in there and then ended up cutting them just because, like, later in the game, I, I didn't love it. I, I like the cycle lands a lot. Um, I did try a few games with, uh, like, crop rotation. I, I like that card a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't have enough, like, reps with it to want to play that at Misty. Um, and then you and I talked, like, the night before. I think we are expecting a whole bunch of goblins. So mm -hmm. I put in the powder keg. Um, and that seemed fine. I don't know. Mm -hmm. it, it, one of main deck. I think I blew some stuff up. But it was mostly, like, for goblins, other mocks and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, maybe it should be inside board. Not at all. Either way is fine. Um, okay. Wild Growth, the first time I played that, I did like that quite a bit. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd probably keep, like, one or two of those in it. But uh, more than anything, what I really want is, like, a core haven. Um, it's like sure. one of my favorite cards I think is like missing out of there. So when I like think about like green, white prison, uh, oath versus this, like core Haven is a card I miss more than anything. And that helps a lot versus like the such ghouls, dreadnoughts, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Plus it kind of fits in with the synergy of being a land going to a whole nother color for it. It's a little awkward. So I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I think obviously there's a few slots. I, I think it's really cool if you look at like TV Tyrant's history with the deck though, and even like already pointed this out at the tournament. Like you can look at like the first time TV Tyrant played it like a year ago and just like the evolutions it's gone <laughs> through and exactly. just like the, the sheer perseverance of sticking with it, innovating, innovating, innovating. And now lo and behold, like shoots up from tier four to tier one, you know, just from that, all that effort and uh, testing and stuff with it. It's really cool and to see. I love it. So guys, where we're going to go here from now is, um, do we think this deck has staying power within the format? Once people are familiar with it, can they adapt to it, know the plan, know how to play against it? Does this deck have staying power once it's figured out, or is it a deck that starts to lose a lot of its ground once people are familiar with it? I would say uh, the deck is obviously every deck that's the Brewer's deck is going to have Brewer's advantage. Um, yes. it, the deck has a very real weakness that everyone should know right, right off the top of their head. It's called Sabo's Web. I don't know if you can mm -hmm. do a little picture of it. Uh Rick, Rick, Ricky saw that one. He liked it. He liked yeah. It. Oh, is that, what's that card again? What's that do? So uh, it, it makes your life really bad. 
<laughs> so Sabo's web, like even when I was building the deck, I was like, I sure hope people don't put this in their deck. Um, I put it in my sideboard yeah. for stasis. Yeah, well, so we're kind I of like... I had a main deck stasis. <laughs> Yeah, the like last MLS league, you'll see when it posts. Yeah, it had main deck Sabo's web in there. Nice. It's it's a it's a great card, and it's I don't know if I don't know if the rest of the format requires it. So like we're safe as long as they're not citing that in. But we do have like a definite like somebody throws a Sabo's web down fast. I'm not sure our deck can do anything except if you can slam a quick Terravore. Like sure. you can't fetch. You can't activate things. Like, you're just out of luck on it. Uh, so mm. it does have a blind... To everybody out there, my deck has a blinding weakness. <laughs> um, I think the solution, if it becomes popular enough that people start putting web in their side, is that we're going to start running more crumbles in the side, and that's going to be the, like, mm. arms race. Is will be, And then, ironically, that would actually make the deck better at one of its bad matchups, because that would fix the Dreadnought matchup if we were running four crumbles. So like, sure. you know, I okay. think I think there's going to be some interplay. I know for a fact that some of the decks, like Madness, used to be a buy. I've the first like twenty times I played Madness in a row, I think I just took it uh, mm. because Madness has bad lands, bad mana, weak creatures. Like it's just not really threatening. And they started putting Gilded Drake into the for into the deck specifically to steal Terravores from us. And uh, it makes it a lot harder. Like, you have Waterfront Bouncer and a Gilded Drake, and, like, they they have a, an actual out now, which they didn't have before. Um, Gilded Drake is also in my stasis sideboard right now. <laughs> so so we have weaknesses, and I'm, I'm really hoping people start playing them. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that that'll be fun, like, seeing how that changes the deck as well. Absolutely. All right, guys, so we're going to move into our favorite part. Um, every time with this podcast, I got three questions. Uh, those questions are what is the most underrated card in pre-modern, most overrated, and the card that needs to be broken. So, Tyrant, we're going to start with you. What is the most overrated card in pre-modern, in your opinion? Swords to Plowshares. Swords to Plowshares. Boy, that's a spicy take. Um, <laughs> I don't even need an explanation. We're going to have people listen to it and just try and guess. Um, so, Source of Plowshares. Uh, Ricky, what is your most overrated card in pre-modern? Uh, Cataclysm. Cataclysm. I, I, I don't think I've ever lost with any deck after someone has cast a Cataclysm on me. Um, All right. I, that might be, I might be lying, but I'm pretty sure. You tried hard, though. Uh, all right, then. Uh, Tyrant, what is the most underrated card in pre-modern? Coat of Arms. Coat of uh, Arms. You need to say at least a couple sentences on Coat of Arms. Okay, so Coat of Arms is like this card that I only found out about about three weeks ago. And then I went on a mad race to figure out how to break it, and it's Elves. And then I got bored, because, like, Elves doesn't need anything. It's it's fine. Uh, but Coat okay. of Arms is this 5 out of artifact that has every creature has power, adds one power and toughness for each other creature in play that, add, that has the same type as it. So, like, if you have a bunch of elves and you just ramp it out turn three, now all your elves are six sixes forever, right? Like, yeah. it's it's a, it's a massive ramp spell. It's a little, it's expensive, obviously, but, like, all it needs is, like, a home where something can make enough mana quickly enough and pour out a bunch of shitty creatures, right? Which, of yeah. course, is elves. Like, you don't have to natural order with elves. You can just slap a coat of arms down on the same turn and be <laughs> like, there you go, I win next turn, like, you know, Terravores be damned. So I think that's that's an underrated card for sure. All right. Uh, Ricky, what is your most underrated card in pre-modern? I was going to say Sabo's Web, but that one's out there. So now um, for my stasis sideboard, I will say Bribery. Got it. Bribery. I like, I like a bribery. All your exalted angels are not safe. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Ricky, listen to this for you. What is a card that needs to be broken in pre-modern? Windborn Muse. Um, Wind big fan. Combos well with like Armageddon and Land Hate. I, I think it's sweet. Propaganda slapped on a body. I think it's got a bright future ahead of it. All right. And then Tyrant, how about you? I think Tinker. Uh, I think of all the legacy band cards that we're not playing. I think Tinker is the one that I'm always like, why aren't we playing Tinker? Um, because they banned all the good things that it can go get. 
Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> accurate, but like, I, I think that out there, you know, there's, there's a, a gush days counter spell wasteland tinker deck that's just waiting Not to evil. be evil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. All right, guys. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to both of you. Ricky, again, winning the uh, Misty Mountain Games Pre-Modern Fall Cup. Uh, TV Tyrant going on tears on Moto. Um, these guys are guys you want to pay attention to. Um, if you're looking for Pre-Modern, guys, just Google it. Google Pre-Modern. You'll find a bunch of stuff. This podcast, other podcasts. There's all sorts of ways to play. I want to thank both of you for being with us today. And I want everybody to take care and have a wonderful day. Thank you, William. You guys have a great Thanks. night. Yep. You too.